Even the critics agree. Listen free on Apple Podcasts. You're not serving or protecting when you make movie popcorn and put up your feet and lounge. Lounging on duty. Surveillance video shows several Chicago police officers hanging out in a congressman's burglarized campaign office. What officials say was going on outside that office that's adding to the outrage. A nation divided. The stunning statistics on the arrests of African Americans across the country. New numbers show how much more likely black people are to be arrested than white people. The exclusive investigation. The president taking sides, calling on Washington's governor and the mayor of Seattle to, quote, take back the city from protesters who've established an autonomous police-free zone. Meanwhile, America's top general today breaking from the president regarding the protests, apologizing for his role in Trump's photo op, walking from the White House to St. John's Church. The latest reaction. Called out, the state senator now apologizing after using racist language during a committee hearing and questioning if black people are getting COVID more often because they don't wash their hands as well as others. His colleague's response and the calls for him to resign. Finding a path forward, a roundtable discussion with black female mayors, how their experience informs their position and what police reform would look like in their cities. And finding the finish line after a grueling Iditarod race, how the pandemic made the winner's journey home even more challenging. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis, and thank you so much for streaming with us. Many people talk about it anecdotally, the notion of driving while black or the overall racial disparity in policing. We've, of course, seen the videos, heard the stories, or even experienced it firsthand, being stopped or singled out by police for the color of your skin. But now we're pulling back the curtain on the actual numbers. An ABC News exclusive investigation in partnership with ABC-owned stations shows how black men and women are far more likely to be arrested than white people, as much as 10 times greater in some areas. So what does this kind of racial disparity tell us about what it means to be black in America? ABC's Pierre Thomas has this exclusive report. Hey, Why are you trying to choke his neck, man? Nobody's choking him. This encounter in Tulsa caught on tape of white officers stopping black teens for jaywalking on a seemingly quiet suburban road without sidewalks. I was walking down the street. Now sparking an internal investigation into whether the tactics were too aggressive. Within seconds, one of the teens wrestled to the ground, handcuffed. What you follow me for? Because you were What you follow me for? You broke the law, that's why. In the wake of George Floyd's death, questions about whether police treat African Americans differently differently than their white counterparts are becoming more urgent. An ABC News investigation in partnership with ABC-owned stations revealing startling statistics. Our analysis of data reported to the FBI by departments from across the country showing in 800 jurisdictions, black people were arrested at a rate five times higher than white people in 2018 when accounting for the racial makeup of the cities and counties those police serve. In 250 localities, blacks were 10 times more likely to be arrested than their white counterparts. When you see the higher numbers in terms of contacts between police and minority communities, um, that also increases the likelihood that you're going to have forceful interaction. We have to deal with the over-policing of low-income African-American communities in our country. It is a pervasive problem. In places like Minneapolis, where Mr. Floyd died, African-Americans make up just over 19 percent of the total population, but account for a whopping 63 percent of arrests. I feel like being a black six-foot man in America, I'm a threat. Akil Carter was on his way home from church with his white grandmother when police pulled him over. He says the next thing he knew, guns were drawn, and he was ordered out of the car. In the suburb of Milwaukee, where Akil was detained, blacks are only 5% of the population, but accounted for 62% of arrests made in 2018, a rate 20 times higher than white arrests. I was so terrified for my life because... I don't know what's going to happen next. When he put me down on my knees, I was even more scared. Akil was handcuffed, detained, and put in the back of a squad car. When he was finally released, police simply said this was a misunderstanding. No apologies. I just wanted to live. I feel like if I was white, it, it would have went completely different. 
While the data shows African Americans are arrested at a higher rate than white people, some say that's a reflection of high crime in black communities. When you hear people say things like, well, there's a lot of crime in some black communities, therefore, that's why their arrest numbers are high. Do you buy it? I don't. I don't. And the data, the data speaks for itself. We, we look and we see, for example, with drug use, that there are similar rates of drug use, marijuana use, among white folks and black folks. White folks will get a slap on the wrist, and black folks will be the ones profiled, targeted, and subject to arrest and prosecution. There also appears to be racial disparities in sentencing. A recent report by the Federal U.S. Sentencing Commission found that blacks were sentenced to prison terms an average of 19 percent longer than their white counterparts for the same exact crime. That would be nearly an entire extra year on top of a white offender's five-year sentence. When we see data that shows that African Americans are, are singled out, unfairly targeted, disproportionately subject to arrest and prosecution, that should sound an alarm. Just relax. And we now bring in Pierre Thomas live. And Pierre, this is really stunning data. Help us understand the big picture as far as what it tells us. Listen, the data doesn't confirm their systemic racism in police departments, but numbers so stark do raise the question of whether there's bias in policing. In one location, we found blacks were 29 times more likely to be arrested than their white counterparts. And we know that police officers certainly have a lot of discretion about who they decide to ultimately arrest. So could that mean that there's more opportunity for racial bias, whether it's conscious or not? It could. Police have a lot of power when they're dealing with the public, including the power to give warnings in certain kinds of crimes. You see in that Tulsa case, for example, the officers had the option to tell the young men they were jaywalking and to give them a warning. But you saw how that quickly escalated, Lindsay. All right. Our thanks to Pierre Thomas and also his team for diving into that data for this exclusive investigation. Protests in some parts of the country are not showing any signs of slowing down. In Seattle, demonstrators have taken over a police station and created an autonomous zone, vowing to occupy the area until a list of demands, including defunding the police, is met. President Trump tweeted a threat to intervene, demanding the governor and mayor, quote, take back their city now. Seattle Mayor Durkin responded, Go back to your bunker. Our Matt Gutman is there tonight. Tonight, that continuing standoff in Seattle. What do we want? When do we want it? Now! Protesters seizing a six-block area outside this police precinct, which is now boarded up and abandoned. Have you ever heard of police abandoning a police precinct? No, not on purpose. The so-called autonomous zone now complete with barricades, a clinic, and free food. The people recognize that this building is the is the people's. You know, we pay for it with our taxes. We just want to make sure that it's being used for the right things. Seattle PD under fire for its tactics over the past couple of weeks. Flashbangs and pepper spray used on crowds. This little girl crying in pain. 14,000 complaints against police. And today, in an address to officers, the police chief angry over the retreat. You should know, leaving the precinct was not my decision. You fought for days to protect it. I ask you to stand on that line day in and day out. The chief says police now can't respond to all the calls for violent crimes in the neighborhood. President Trump calling on the governor and mayor to take back your city now. If you don't, I will. Seattle's mayor firing back. Make us all safe. Go back to your bunker. Powerful words there, fighting words. And Matt Gutman joins us now live from Seattle. Matt, what's the scene like there now? And are you hearing any rumblings about protesters leaving anytime soon? I mean, you're looking at it, Lindsay. Uh, that's the sixth precinct right behind us. Uh, there are a few hundred people standing around there listening to people speak. And as far as I've heard, there are no rumblings of people leaving. In fact, we did see police going in that only uh, agitated the crowd, police going in that only agitated the crowd. It seems that people are here to stay for as long as it takes and what they want what they're demanding is to defund the police what we're hearing all over the country they're also demanding the release of protesters who've been arrested and they want to turn that precinct into a community center Lindsay. all right matt gutman in seattle for us tonight our thanks to you matt i should not have been there those were the words in a stunning apology from the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff General Mark Milley for his role in President Trump's now infamous photo op at St. John's Church across the street from the White House. Chief White House correspondent Jonathan Carl has a closer look now at his remarks and how they're playing out in the West Wing. 
Today, President Trump's top military advisor, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, apologized for walking with the president and his top aides across Lafayette Park to that photo op outside of St. John's Church. General Milley was right there, wearing his battle uniform. Just 30 minutes earlier, the space was forcibly cleared of peaceful protesters. I should not have been there. My presence in that moment and in that environment created a perception of the military involved in domestic politics. As a commissioned uniformed officer, it was a mistake that I've learned from. And I sincerely hope we all can learn from it. The extraordinary apology comes after some of the nation's most respected retired military officers have condemned the episode, including former Defense Secretary General Jim Mattis, who blasted moving those protesters to, quote, provide a bizarre photo op for the elected commander-in-chief with military leadership standing alongside. Milley's comments were part of a commencement address for the National Defense University. He spoke forcefully about the right to protest as a bedrock American value. Few other nations have been able to change for the greater good, and that is because of the rights and values embedded in our Constitution. The freedoms guaranteed to us in the Constitution allow people to demand change just as the peaceful protesters are doing all across the country. He urged the graduates to reflect on what they have witnessed over the past two and a half weeks. What it means to all of us as Americans, what it means to you and I as leaders. Milley's apology comes amidst growing calls to rename U.S. Army bases that are now named for Confederate generals. The president has come out strongly against it, tweeting they have become part of a great American heritage. But today, the Republican-led Senate Armed Services Committee defied the president, voting to require that the bases be renamed. Today, some Republican senators said the time has come. If you want to continue to name ports after soldiers, there have been a lot of great soldiers that have come long since the Civil War. Well, I think this is a step in the right direction. This is the right time for it. And Jonathan Carl joins us now with more. John, we're learning more about the general's reaction to that photo op. What can you tell us? Lindsay, ABC News has learned that General Milley was so upset about his role in what happened that day in Lafayette Park that he actually thought about resigning, but ultimately decided as a leader that he would be letting down the troops that were out there that day and that the better course of action would be to issue an apology and deliver that message that you heard him deliver to his fellow service members about the role of, a mili of the military in American society and the importance of the right to protest. And John, as you reported, the president will hold his first campaign rally in months in Tulsa next week. But the campaign also added a pretty stunning warning to the event about COVID-19. What's going on there? Yeah, this is something else. First of all, uh, we're told that they uh, don't plan to reduce the number of people. Uh, this will be a typical Trump rally uh, packed with people. At least that's the plan right now. Uh, and anybody that goes to the rally, any of the Trump supporters who attend, will have to check a box saying that they recognize uh, the dangers of COVID-19 and effectively they will not sue the campaign if they become infected. Uh, really, uh, I've never heard of an, an ex uh, disclosure, anything like that, uh, that has been expected to be agreed to uh, by supporters of a campaign going into a campaign event. Yeah, really unprecedented stuff here. Jonathan Carl from the White House for us. Thanks, John. Thanks, Lindsay. With more than 2 million reported cases of COVID-19 in the U.S., health officials are now predicting the future spread of the virus, and it doesn't look good. While some regions have seen great improvement, others are seeing a rise in cases. Our Kaylee Hartung has the latest on the pandemic here in the United States. Tonight, a dire prediction. The coronavirus could kill 200,000 Americans by September. The U.S. already topping 113,000 deaths. We opened up with when the case level levels were still quite high. Uh, we did not have enough testing in most states, so we're now seeing the consequences of that. As the country continues to reopen, a top Harvard health official warning, without drastic action, more people will die. If we don't act, uh, the future is very grim. Two months ago, President Trump saying that startling number would be a sign the administration's response has been effective. We have between 100 and 200,000. Uh, we all together have done a very good job. Tonight, 20 states and Puerto Rico reporting increases in new cases. Texas with more new cases Wednesday than it's ever had in a single day. Houston taking innovative precautions, announcing a COVID threat alert system. One official sounding this alarm. 
we may be approaching the precipice, the precipice of a disaster. In Arizona, daily new cases doubling over the past two weeks and ICU beds are filling up. A month after Florida reopened, the state's reporting its highest number of new cases since the pandemic started. All this as other governors reject the idea of reinstating lockdowns as cases rise. We made the right decision to go ahead and lift some of these restrictions so that we don't cause more damage to people's lives and uh, their livelihood. And after another dismal unemployment report, the Dow plunging another 1,800 points. And Kaylee Hartung joins us now. Kaylee, so much of getting back to work relies upon going back to school. What are some of the plans that we're learning about for returning to the classroom? Yeah, well, Lindsay, it depends on who you ask. In Florida, for example, Governor Ron DeSantis is saying he wants schools back at full capacity in the fall, and he's arguing that his state's economy depends on it. But school districts there, they're something of independent agencies. So what he's saying is just a recommendation to them. So you go down to South Florida, Broward County, Palm Beach County, they're looking at plans that would put kids back in school for maybe two days a week, maybe just in the mornings. Go up to Massachusetts, they're looking at a plan similar to what those those districts in South Florida are thinking about a part time plan. And then you go to North Carolina. They're talking about half days, maybe alternating days. That being the case, if the situation there doesn't improve. Lindsay. Kaylee Hartung, thanks so much for your reporting tonight, Kaylee. The rise in COVID-19 cases led to a brutal day on Wall Street. The Dow sank more than 1,800 points, and all three major averages saw their worst day since the middle of March. ABC's business correspondent Deidre Bolton is here with more. Deidre, what's behind today's sell-off? Well, you mentioned it. I mean, this is the worst day in three months for the markets. And what's really behind the sell-off is the fact that the pandemic is not over. We've seen new cases, new hospitalizations in Texas, in Arizona, in California. So obviously the coronavirus affects our health. It also affects the economy. Economic consumer spending, that's two-thirds of GDP. So it doesn't matter how many restaurants are open, Lindsay, as you well know, if we're not comfortable enough to go and sit in them, eventually those restaurants, those kinds of businesses will suffer. It also keeps corporate America on hold. It's very difficult if you're an executive, you ha are in a decision-making position. It's really difficult to want to invest, to want to hire if you don't really have an idea of how this pandemic is going to be managed longer term. I also want to mention something from the point of view of a trader. If you look at our low point for the markets in March, the S&P 500 had risen 45%, I'm not counting today, from that low point in March until today, 45%. So that was a really steep gain. And there are a lot of traders who are saying, honestly, that was just too far, too fast, when we still have this unknown of the pandemic and how to handle it, Lindsay. And the head of the Federal Reserve sees a long road to recovery. What does that mean exactly? He did give a pretty dour forecast, there's no other way to say it, saying that he is not looking for growth, economic growth in the United States this year. He did call for growth next year, but also said the unemployment rate he sees finishing this year around 9.2, 9.3%. So that really just underlines how much further we have yet to come back. Even if you look at today's data, weekly initial jobless claims, Americans are filing for unemployment benefits at a rate that is seven times what they were pre-pandemic. So clearly there is a lot of weakness in the economy, a lot of weakness in the labor market, and essentially the Fed Chairman Jerome Powell saying, listen, we can help as much as possible as the Fed, but also Congress has to act. So his vision is obviously to support the U.S. economy as much as possible, but to your point, he did say it would be a long way back. He said this is an unprecedented modern economic moment, Lindsay. Yeah, unprecedented indeed. Deidre, thanks so much for your reporting. Yeah, sure. And we have breaking news now out of California where the scene is tense in San Luis Obispo County. Hundreds of officers have been on the hunt for a gunman who allegedly ambushed a police station, shooting a deputy in the face and then killing another man. And now word of another shooting. Will Carr is now live on the scene. Will, what's the latest? 
Lindsay, this is an active, volatile situation. We know that shots have been fired here. I want to show exactly what we're seeing. Hundreds of officers have swarmed this area. We have seen SWAT team members running around with AR-15s. We've seen multiple helicopters in the area. When you look down this street, at the end of this street is actually a riverbed. We know that authorities have tried to box this suspect in at the end of this street, and you can see they are just racing all around. We are hearing uh, sirens nonstop going on through here. This this all started yesterday when a 26-year-old suspect allegedly unloaded on a police station in the middle of the night. He ended up in an exchange, a gunfire exchange with several deputies. A deputy was shot in the face. Then a little bit later in the morning, they actually found a body, another man who was shot in the head at a nearby Amtrak station. They believe it was all from the same gunman, the gunman who they possibly have boxed in behind us at this point. Like I said, this is a very fluid situation. Uh, authorities are being very careful. They'll tell they're telling us that we are on the edge of the hot zone right now, and we just continue to see members of law enforcement flying past uh, on the interstate and on this little side road that we're on right now, Lindsay. All right, Will Carr, stay safe, and thank you so much for your reporting. And turning gears now to Louisville, Kentucky, the incident report indicates Brianna Taylor had no injuries when she died, but she was shot eight times by officers who burst into her home with a no-knock search warrant. That glaring discrepancy has sparked new outrage in that case. Steve Osinsami has more. It's one of the other shootings of black Americans that has sent protesters to the streets. This one, a woman in Louisville, Kentucky, saying her name, Brianna Taylor. And tonight, police who've been called out for killing her have released this incident report after three long months, and it's nearly blank, with very few details on what went wrong. The 26-year-old ambulance worker was shot dead in her own home March 13th by police who were trying to serve a no-knock warrant meant for someone else who was already in police custody. 911, where is your emergency? I don't know what's happening. Somebody kicked in the door and shot my girlfriend. The report lists her injuries as none, even though she was shot eight times. Officers used a battering ram to break down her door, but under forced entry, it's checked no. None of the officers have been charged. I think it's insane. Why would you want to enter into a home in the middle of the night without announcing yourselves? This time, there is no police body camera video showing what happened, and police say they won't comment on an ongoing investigation. Our thanks to Steve Osinsami and also want to pass along to just a little while ago, we learned that the Louisville City Council unanimously passed Brianna's law, which severely restricts police from conducting no-knock warrants. And when we come back, the growing outrage after several Chicago officers were captured on video relaxing inside a congressman's office while nearby businesses were looted. The calls from protesters to do something about the kids show Paw Patrol after other shows focused on law enforcement have been canceled. And up next, you won't believe how long it took the winner of the Iditarod to get back home with his animals because of COVID-19. It's a journey you will not want to miss. stories of our time anytime nightline right now how do you make sense of it all now afternoons on ebc one place with the good information you need we are all in this together and we're going to get through this together pandemic what you need to know afternoons at 1 eastern 12 central and pacific on ebc Welcome back. Imagine traveling to the remote regions of Alaska, later winning one of the most grueling races in the world, and then finding out you are stuck and cannot get back to your family. Well, this is what happened to the winner of this year's Iditarod, and he and his 16 dogs waited for months because of the pandemic travel restrictions worldwide, trying to find a way back to his native Norway. Kana Whitworth brings us his remarkable journey and how he finally made it home. In more than three decades of mushing, 47-year-old Thomas Warner finally crowned champion. A grueling, lonely feat, but he won the 2020 Iditarod dog sledding race. But while he was crossing the Alaskan wilderness, the world around him had completely changed. Tonight, with daily life grinding to a halt across America, the White House announcing drastic steps, part of a 15-day plan to slow the spread. Three months after he stood victorious under the burled arch in Nome, 
he was still in Alaska, unable to get home to Norway. It's a pretty long time. The longest time I've been away from the family. Warner's journey began February 21st. It took four days, four planes, and four different people to fly him and his 16 Huskies from Norway to Alaska. And on March 7th, as COVID-19 was beginning to take hold in the U.S., he and his dogs embarked on a journey of more than 1,000 miles from Anchorage to Nome, Alaska. In an eerie parallel, the race itself pays homage to a rescue effort nearly 100 years ago when the village of Nome was struck with a diphtheria outbreak. The life-saving drug for the town was delivered from Anchorage to Nome by mushers and sled dogs. Today, the race has become the ultimate test of endurance and toughness, sometimes battling temperatures 60 below and biting winds. You are, actually have to be mentally strong inside and have a good feeling inside for your dogs, actually. Because as soon as you are feeling worried or stressed or depressed or whatever, you know, your dogs will feel it. And you can actually look that the performance on the dogs goes down if they feel that you're, you are not feeling good. This year, Warner faced a different obstacle. A few days into the race, he received an unexpected text from his wife, who had traveled to support him. I got the message when I was on the Yukon from my wife and my in reach, and then the day she said, I have to go. They are closing down the airlines on Saturday. I just have to go. I can't meet you, no. So that's what actually was the first time I saw, you know, this is actually going to be a problem getting home. With five children at home and dozens more dogs in Norway, she had to go. So when he crossed the finish line after nine days, the celebration looked a bit different in the midst of a pandemic. So it was a lot of people actually meeting me when I went into the finish line, but after that, it was just nothing. Everything was shut down. After three months abroad, Warner went on a journey of a different kind, the journey home. He and his 16 dogs boarded a historic DC-6 cargo plane. This is the story you're going to remember. The Norwegian Aviation Museum had been looking to buy the old carrier for some time, and as luck would have it, not only was Warner in touch with the person who owned it, he was back in Fairbanks, 500 miles away from his finish line, and now in the same city as the cargo plane. A win-win for everyone. The museum got a great deal on the jet and Warner hitched a ride home. It took some 24 hours for the plane to make it to its new city and Warner receiving a hero's welcome, but perhaps the sweetest victory of all, finally being able to reunite with his wife, kids, and 35 other dogs. Kana Whitworth, ABC News, Los Angeles. Our thanks to Kena for that. And still ahead here on ABC News Prime, our conversation with the mayors of several cities, how being black and being a female has shaped their approach to governing during these turbulent times. We take a closer look at the jobless figures, who is being hit the hardest. But first, our tweet of the day, Spider-Man in 2020. In times like these, the news-making events happen here. ABC News. President Trump meeting face-to-face -face with one of the world's most brutal dictators, Kim Jong-un. The president. You trust him. I do trust him, yeah. I think he trusts me, and I trust him. Ivanka Trump. I have to ask you about your emails. Your father had taken Hillary Clinton to task for this. There just is no equivalency. So the idea of lock her up doesn't apply to you? No. <laughs> Comey. How strange is it for you to sit here and compare the president to a mob boss? Very strange. Michelle Obama. What do you wish you could tell your pre-White House self? Whew. Melania Trump. Do you think there's still people there that he can't trust? Yes. Still working now? Yes. Michael Cohen. So he's still lying? Yes. It's a big statement. And now, in a year with so much on the line, we're right there. Good evening tonight from Washington, a very busy news night. America's number one news source, ABC News, straightforward.
And welcome back, everyone. We turn now to the economic downturn. It's yet another crisis that has disproportionately impacted communities of color. Prior to the pandemic, black Americans were seeing impressive job market gains, but sadly, those have been wiped out in recent months. We take a closer look now by the numbers. The unemployment rate of black Americans was 5.8% in February, right before the pandemic. This is near the lowest rate since records began in the early 70s. But now that unemployment rate has tripled to 16.8%, according to the Labor Department data from May. For Hispanics, the unemployment rate is now 17.6%. By contrast, 12.4% of white workers are now unemployed. Last year, the employment gap between blacks and whites seemed to be closing. In April 2019, black unemployment was 5.4%, just two percentage points above that of whites, the narrowest it's ever been since they started recording. That gap is now widening. And black business ownership, that's also fallen a stunning 41% since the start of the pandemic, according to the National Bureau of Economic Research. That's compared to a 22% hit to all business owners across the country and we still have lots ahead tonight our conversation with several mayors what does the defund the police movement look like in their cities the challenges they face and the one thing they'll now do differently as a result of this moment and a stunning comment from one Ohio lawmaker what he said during a forum on racism but first here's some of the trending stories on abcnews.com Session of migrants goes back two miles. There is going to be catastrophic damage. This fire has made a run. You can see those flames shooting up into the sky. We are on the jam packed red carpet. Let's do it right, guys. So, this is the fourth week end of protest. <laughs> Watch NBC News on location for Facebook Watch. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. So if you like getting behind the biggest news stories of the day, inside all the details, the backstory, and what will happen next, then listen to Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. It's like no other news podcast out there. Even the critics agree. Listen free on Apple Podcasts. Rallying cries getting louder coast to coast with thousands continuing to demand police reform. In Seattle, some protesters have occupied a part of downtown, calling it an autonomous zone, taking control of a police precinct and the surrounding area earlier this week. Since then, no officers in sight. President Trump now condemning city and state officials, threatening to step in to take back the city, tweeting that if you don't do it, I will. Domestic terrorists have taken over Seattle. Governor Jay Inslee firing back, saying a man who is totally incapable of governing should stay out of Washington state's business. Meanwhile, in Chicago, Congressman Bobby Rush is accusing officers of relaxing in his campaign office while nearby areas were being looted. One was asleep on my couch in my, at my campaign office. Congressman Rush said he discovered the footage after his office was broken into. Mayor Lori Lightfoot has called it embarrassing. You're not serving or protecting when you make movie popcorn and put up your feet and lounge while your fellow officers are down the street getting the hell beaten out of them. Amid the national outcry for police reform, TV network a and &E canceled its top-rated TV show, Live PD. After over 30 years on the air, ride-along show Cops was also axed. Now, some on social media say the animated kids' show Paw Patrol is problematic for featuring a German shepherd as a cop. The show took a temporary pause in programming amid the protests. On Wall Street, the Dow plunged more than 1,800 points as a rise in coronavirus cases is causing pessimism about the economy quickly recovering. Starbucks is expected to lose more than $3 billion in revenue in its fiscal third quarter due to coronavirus. The coffee giant says the outbreak will also slash its operating income by $2.2 billion for the quarter. And with consumer patterns shifting, the company says it will close 400 stores in the U.S. and Canada while adding carry-out-only locations. 
After nearly seven years of marriage, Kelly Clarkson is reportedly calling it quits, filing for divorce from her husband, Brandon Blackstock. The original American Idol winner first met Blackstock when he worked as a road manager for Rascal Flats. Clarkson shares two kids with her husband, aged five and four. Do you miss showing off your entire face? Now there's a way to remind the world what you look like while staying safe. It's called the BioVisor. Retailing for $172, the startup has already raised over $300,000 on Indiegogo. Backers can expect to strap on the head harness sometime in June. That is unique. <laughs> Last month, I talked to a commissioner in an Ohio county declaring racism a public health crisis. Well, this week, the Ohio state legislature introduced similar legislation, which, if passed, would make it the first of its kind at a state level. And one state senator there is under fire after making what some of his fellow lawmakers are calling a racist comment during a hearing on the bill yesterday. Here's what Steve Huffman said and how the testifying Dr. Angela Dawson responded. that those populations are more vulnerable. So do all populations need to wash their hands? Absolutely, sir. But that is not where you are going to find the, the variance and the rationale for why these populations are more vulnerable. Huffman has since apologized for his question, calling it, quote, unintentionally awkward. And this evening, his employer, Team Health, says he's been fired, calling the comments wholly inconsistent with their mission. The Ohio ACLU is calling for the senator's removal from office. Their leader, Jay Bennett Guest, sent in a statement that the question was, quote, ignorant, heinous, and callously hurtful. One Democratic Ohio senator responded by calling Huffman's words, quote, racist foolishness, and another has used it as an opportunity to encourage Huffman's constituents to vote him out this November. And next to our conversation with a group of black women who are running major cities in this country during a time when so much is about race, equality, and justice, how their own experiences have uniquely prepared them for these turbulent times. And it's, of course, when I see you all, a big smile comes on my uh, face. So I'm certainly uh, thankful for the sisterhood that exists, because I know we all understand what each other is going through. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You are, you are our shero. Oh, no. Yes. My That's right. It's an exclusive sorority of sorts that just six years ago only had one active member. Today, there are seven black women running America's 100 largest cities. I want to know, how does your blackness make you uniquely positioned for such a time as this? Uh, that's, a, that's a really great question because um, I live in a city where we're less than 11 percent. We're a mid-sized city, 215,000 people, 11 percent African-American. And so it says a lot. And let me be clear, I'm the second black woman to serve back to back in the city. So that says a lot about about my community um, and my city. But I will also say that um, I've just been able to lead. I've just been able to be Victoria Woodards from Tacoma and lead. I never had to lead with my color. And, and last week, I was challenged to be not just Victoria Woodard's mayor of Tacoma, but Victoria Woodard's a black woman who happens to be mayor of Tacoma. And, and, and I can tell you that um, it wasn't something that I've ever had to step up and do before. Um, but, but I know that me being mayor at this time is making a difference in this matter for my city. And this, if there's ever been a moment since I've been mayor, and I'm, I'm sure um, my sister mayors can agree with this, this is just a time to lead with our head and our heart. So my, my heart is ab above everything else. I am a mother to four black children in this country, and then taking all of the emotions and all of the cares and concerns that go along with that and translating it to my head on how do you lead in a moment of time where there is no playbook, there's been no playbook for COVID-19. We've just had to figure it out. 
But I think that when it comes from an authentic place and a, and a pure place of caring concern, um, you get true compassionate leadership, and that's what, I, what I've been able to bring. But I think the other side of that is when it comes from a place that's not pure, you get what you are seeing out of the White House, and, and that's just uh, a catastrophe. Yeah, two things come to my mind. Uh, of course, uh, Baton Rouge had an officer-involved shooting in 2016. I was running for mayor at that time and uh, thankfully became the first female mayor of uh, our city of Baton Rouge, the first female and African-American. And so I had to navigate what I see going on right now, uh, my first year in office. Uh, and the second thing that came to my mind and I will tell you that we've made progress. But the second thing that has come to my mind over and over again is that being a baby boomer, uh, I grew up uh, in the 60s and I spent, uh, I was born and raised in Chicago and I've spent my adult life here in Baton Rouge. But when I was in the uh, third grade, uh, I heard uh, the story of Emmett Till. And I just didn't hear it from any teacher, but I heard it from his mother, Mrs. Mm -hmm. Mamie Till Mobley. So that mm -hmm. has always stuck in my mind as a student at Carter mm -hmm. Elementary School in Chicago, Illinois. What I, I'm struck by is we have a special responsibility. Uh, we control big budgets. Our workforces uh, in Washington, I'll speak for us, are largely African American. Our school uh, district serves mostly African American children. Uh, so we have a special responsibility in this time of COVID while um, we're slowly reopening and on the other side to make sure that we have a more fair recovery uh, for people who will be coming um, back to our economy. When it comes to sending a message to Washington, it doesn't get much bolder than this. This paint job on 16th Street leading up to the White House is courtesy Mayor Muriel Bowser. Mayor Bowser and that bold message that she sent uh, to Washington. And so, Mayor, let's just start with that. And, and where did you come up with the idea? And what, beyond the yellow letters, what are you hoping that people are going to take away from that? Well, the big thing that um, people should recognize is that in the days uh, prior to that, the federal government had basically uh, uh, encroached on D.C. streets. Uh, the president moved the United States Army, um, troops from around the country uh, to basically police fellow Americans who were peacefully protesting. Uh, we were able to push them back from our street and back onto Lafayette Park. And when we reclaimed that space, we really wanted to be it to be a space for healing, uh, strategizing, and peaceful protest. Uh, and uh, we wanted it to be clear that this was a D.C. street um, and the D.C. residents would decide how it would be used. And uh, what better message uh, in a time where we're all um, just hurt and angry about uh, a man being killed on the street in an American city by a police officer than to send a clear message um, that Black Lives Matter. And, and mayors, I'm curious, in the other cities, what your initial response was when you saw this, this bold move, <laughs> and if it's at all something that you might consider doing in your own cities. I sent Mayor Bowser a text, and I said that was a boss blank blank move, um, because <laughs> I was just, um, I was so inspired by the boldness of it personally, just as a, a, a fellow mayor, because I could witness the frustration that she was having and to be able to take that power back in such a symbolic way, I thought was extremely important. And we're having conversations in Atlanta on how we memorialize the same sentiment, just the boldness of it and, and the, the symbolism of it. I think has meant so much, not just for the people of D.C., but for so many of us across this country. Interested in, in, in kind of getting a sense, we sat down uh, recently with the, the mayor of San Francisco, Mayor Breed, and she talked about during this time some men coming to her home with tiki torches and, and taunting her. The other evening, there were white protesters who came to my house uh, with torches of fire, the fireworks, 
the fact that you would come to the black mayor's home and do this and not realize how racist this is, chanting Black Lives Matter, it's disrespectful to the movement. It's disrespectful to black people who unfortunately have suffered in this country and all too often have experienced the pain that finally others are waking up to and seeing for themselves. Wondering if it, at this moment, if being a black woman puts you at uh, increased scrutiny, if you feel like you're uh, potentially gonna be labeled with the angry black woman, if you <laughs> have been subjected more to um, overt racism during this particular time. We saw the president of the United States attack an American mayor, me, um, calling me incompetent uh, because we fought back and spoke up for ourselves. And I, I say frequently uh, that female politicians are attacked more frequently and more wrongly uh, than anybody else. Um, but I think that the difference that you're seeing now is there's a critical mass of us, um, and we are sticking together and working together and sticking up and protecting each other. And we have allies um, in uh, all of the Americans who really want solid leadership, moral leadership, and people that will speak truth to power. One of the biggest challenges um, that I face as mayor of Atlanta, you're, you're balancing some very diverse interests. You're balancing the interest of people in our communities who felt left behind um, with that of corporate interest of, of people who decided to locate their businesses here. And I think, again, that's why, that's what's so special about women leaders, I believe, there is an, uh, a level of authenticness that we bring to leadership that's often not found in men and knowing what the potential is of our city and our communities. And I think layers of that um, relate to, to race and, and to who we are as women. We also talked about this video and accompanying op-ed created last month by black women pressuring Vice President Biden to select a black female running mate. America needs a black woman vice president. I think it would be a, a good choice for him to uh, do that. And there are certainly many qualified uh, women who can step up to the plate and do the job. Some of them might be on this call right now. Yeah, I was going to say, Absolutely. some of them very well may be on this call Lindsay, right now. Lindsay, you took the words out of my mouth. I was going to say, <laughs> say that. And you're absolutely right. Absolutely right. Present person excluded, but I, I, you're absolutely right. I think it's an incredible moment for Vice President Biden to wrap his arms around a lot of energy and to, to galvanize that energy and push that energy to the ballot box um, in November. We're going to let him know that black women are the base of our election. Uh, and we deserve not only a seat at the table, but to be in leadership. It takes different perspectives to look at all issues. I think if you continue to surround yourself with the people who have the same perspective that you do, you don't lead well. You can only lead for a certain group. So Absolutely. I think it's time. I think black women are prepared. I would go further and say, yes, I wanted to be a woman. I wanted to be a black woman because I think there's a perspective that we have. Um, in our experience, Absolutely. in how we lead, and how we treat people. And I think it's about time that the White House needs that perspective. Mayor Bottoms is well, like, okay, moving on. Had... Oh, no, you do want to say, okay. <laughs> no, I was going to say, I, I think he had four great choices on on uh, on right now. So, As far as Democrats go, uh, black women have been the most reliable voting bloc since black women got the right to vote in 1965. And yet, we've never had a black female governor in this country. Black women make up only 1% of the Senate. Why do you think that black women are so underrepresented in these leadership roles? Well, I think that we, uh, you continue to see more black women running. You have black women uh, who are, you, you see on your screen tonight, who are mayors of mid-size and major cities. You have these ladies who are in major states who are in position, uh, if that is the trajectory that they choose to, to be in those leadership roles. The other thing that, that's happening is that the black women who are elected are taking the national stage. And so black women are seeing black women. 
And, and I think we mentor them, but I also think they have to see us doing it to know that it's possible. I know yes. having a black woman elected as mayor of this city before me was incredibly encouraging. Um, but I think you, the, the media is doing a better job of showing who's leading our cities across America. And I think I think that makes a big difference. And I, I think so often we are the last ones to see the power within ourselves. So we call it just doing what we do, but we don't always even know that the name of that is leadership. So you see us leading and organizing our communities. You see us in our churches and in the workplace, and you see us doing it in our sororities. We're doing it each and every day, not always recognizing that those same qualities are the qualities that allow you to lead cities and states and on a national level. And I think to Victoria's point, the fact that we are now seeing it called leadership, I think is inspiring even more women um, to know what's possible because sometimes they just don't know it's possible because they've never seen it before. Less than two weeks ago, when police officers in Atlanta tased college student protesters, Mayor Keisha Bottoms had two of those officers fired immediately. Incident in, in particular, when I saw those two kids, I, I saw my kids. I have an 18 year old son as, as my oldest. And and the first thing that, that I envisioned um, was my son out with, with his friends and that happening to them. So um, it is, um, you know, there are certain things that we carry with us each and every day. But that being said, I think what this moment has taught us, if anything, is that our communities aren't going to wait for, for the normal things that we often go through and how we prolong investigations. And it doesn't mean that there's a rush to judgment, but there will be instances where there are things that are so blatantly wrong that we are going to be called upon to take swift action. Mayor Victoria Woodard, city of Tacoma, is currently grappling with the death of Manuel Ellis killed in police custody more than three months ago, but the circumstances surrounding his death only recently made national headlines. Toxology reports because of the number of deaths that are happening in, in the state, you know, with opioids and other things take a long time. So it's 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 been a long time, but it's been way too long. So I've really been working closely with our governor, number one, to get justice for Manny Ellis. Governor has agreed to do an independent investigation because yesterday we just found out that there was a sheriff's deputy on scene that night as part of the incident, not part of the investigation. So now it's going to the state level. And what I'm pushing for, if the law says in our state, everyone has to have an independent investigation, then we need to take that out of the hands of local law enforcement. It needs to be a statewide agency that looks at every case across the state of Washington. Manny Ellis being the first case, but I think how we learn um, to investigate this case and what we put together to look at this case is something that needs to be taken statewide so that everyone feels like it's been truly independent and that we got justice for those whose lives we lost. Mayor Sharon Weston Broom was elected just months after police fatally shot Alton Sterling outside of a Baton Rouge convenience store. For the uh, past three and a half years since the uh, killing of Alton Sterling, we have implemented significant law enforcement reform in our city, including uh, use of force policies, de-escalation, uh, and the list goes on. So we've made some tremendous strides. We still have work to do. The, the protesters' calls to defund the police, is that really misunderstood? Do you think that that slogan is not really adequate? And what's your response to the calls uh, to defund? on the police and Mayor Bowser will start with you. I do think that the slogan seems to be um, have a lot of different meanings. I think some actually think that you should abolish the police and others mean that you should reform the police. Uh, and I certainly would be in the camp of examining how we reform the police and make sure that our departments are serving the needs of our communities. Uh, I also think that you have to think about public safety, not just in terms of policing, but intervention uh, as well as opportunity. And we have to be funding all of those things. How do we make sure kids have a great education, great housing, and are healthy? Uh, as a mayor of a, a major city, I know too that we need good police. Uh, they need to be well-trained and have great equipment and be held accountable. Uh, and the budget that I just sent to my council uh, funded every police officer that we need. Um, not one too many and not one too few. Um, so 
uh, that is, uh, I think, what we're all called to do. Make sure that we're funding every aspect of public safety, not just policing, but we need the police that we need. And Lindsay, I've been holding up a, a prop all week, and this prop is my city budget book because we're in the middle of our <laughs> budget process. You can see how thick it is. And so it is much more complex than a tagline that says defund the police. And Lindsay, I've been holding up a, a prop all week, and this prop is my city budget book because we're in the middle of our budget process. You can see how thick it is. And so it is much more complex than a tagline that says defund the police. I think really mm -hmm. the, the messaging needs to be reframed because the intent is that we put more money and more effort and more focus on community-based initiatives. So we were already in the process of closing our city jail and transforming it into a center of equity, health, and wellness because we had closed our detention center, um, we had eliminated cash bail bonds, and we no longer set, accept ICE detainees. We ended that contract. So it now gives us an opportunity to reimagine a 400,000 plus square foot detention facility and how can it really become a wellness center for our communities. Mayor Bottoms, in your rebuke to the looters, you said, if you want real change, go and register to vote. And then we all saw the video of the thousands of people waiting for hours in Georgia. And, and who's to blame for that? How can we make those changes? And are, and are you concerned about voter suppression? So the answer is yes, I'm very concerned about voter suppression because that's one form of voter suppression, making it more difficult for people to vote. And so I was encouraged because we had a, an incredibly high turnout um, in our state, but also discouraged because it's the same tricks, people being purged, people waiting in hour, for hours to vote. And the blame lies somewhere between um, some of our county uh, election officials and ultimately with our secretary of state who's charged with overseeing elections in our state. But what I would encourage people across this nation is don't leave it up to chance because we know that voter suppression is real. We saw it in earnest in 2016. We are, we are already seeing it happen now. Can you each name one thing that effective immediately you're going to do differently or reform or work to change um, as a result of this moment? So in Atlanta, we've already um, convened our advisory task force to take a look at our use of force policies in the city and to make some meaningful recommendations on how we move going forward, because too often we are reacting to a situation, but not looking at the entire landscape. So we've already begun that work, and I expect to have recommendations in the next two weeks with a final set of complete recommendations within 45 days. For us in Washington, our police department has been on the pathway for about 18 years um, on reform, and we've done some important things. Uh, one thing that I need the ability to have, the police chief needs, is the ability um, to um, implement discipline immediately uh, for gross misconduct. Uh, and currently, our law and some of our contracts um, don't permit that. Uh, and they also require us to follow our arbiter if our arbiter says that we have to take a police officer back that we've already let go. So there's some things around the labor um, that we that have to be fixed. I want to build on uh, the foundation that we've already uh, established, and that includes making our police department uh, more diverse. We, we do have a diverse police department, 36 uh, percent African-American in a city that is over 50 percent uh, African-American. Uh, but I think it's very important that we remove any obstructions that exist, such as the Police mm -hmm. Civil Service Board, uh, where we have members who are not sensitive to what's going on in terms of discipline, so we can make sure that we have fair and just discipline uh, when it comes to uh, officers, so we don't have uh, bad officers in our department and those with the wrong motivation. One of the things that we're—and we're late to the party on this is we're not waiting till the end of the year to budget cycle to take up body cams. We are meeting next week um, to, to get body cams purchased and, and, and on our officers. It's a good thing to focus on the criminal justice system and forget how we're going to fix that.
But I want to go upstream and figure out how we get people from getting into the criminal justice system. So we need to reform the system, but we also need to reform our government so that people don't end up in the system. And our thanks to the mayors of Atlanta, D.C., Tacoma, and Baton Rouge for their time and the insightful discussion. Before we go tonight, the image of the day. Take a look at this. This is the new PlayStation coming out. Many are wondering why it's so big. Looks like something kind of a throwback to the 90s. But that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live. And for more context and analysis of the day's top stories, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us, and have a good night.